Hello, I'm Paul Gilbert from the Compassionate Mind Foundation, and today I'm delighted to welcome two wonderful people from Compassion in Politics who are about to launch their new book. So let me show you the book. So there we are, that's Jennifer in the top and Matt at the bottom. And uh, this is their new book, How Compassion Can Transform Our Politics, Economy and Society. So today they very kindly agreed to come and talk to me about this book. And so without further ado, I will introduce them to you. Jennifer is a qualified barrister. She's an author, political strategist, activist, and an award-winning television journalist. She has reported for the BBC, Channel 4 News, and ITN's Home Affairs editor. Her report, exposing the use of rape as a weapon of war in Bosnia, was used by the UN War Crimes Investigation. And she's reported extensively on how the law discriminates against women. Her most recent book, We, charts how to bring about individual and social change or societal change. Her father came to the UK on the Kinder Transport. She is on the board of Inquest, a charity which supports families whose relatives have died in custody. So welcome, Jennifer, and I'll be inviting you to say a few words about your book in a moment. And we've also got here uh, Matt Hawkins. Now, Matt has led a number of social environmental justice campaigns. He was part of the Nobel Peace Prize winning team at the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons which successfully lobbied the UN to introduce a ban on nuclear weapons. Most recently, he managed the Equal Civil Partnerships campaign, which secured the introduction of civil partnerships for mixed sex couples. So two really experienced and fantastic uh, activists. Um, so we have this new book for Compassion in Politics. So perhaps maybe we could start by saying, so what got you interested in Compassion in Politics? And then to bring the authors of this book together? Well, we had both spent a lot of time focusing on social and environmental justice on single issue topics. But what we came to realize is that whether it was homelessness or refugees dying at sea or hunger, there was an underlying cause. And rather than address the symptoms of that cause, we wanted to address the cause itself. And that cause is the edging out of compassion from the political space and the snipping away of the social contract, which largely had a consensus around the idea that we should take over those who take care of those who have least and fall upon hard times. And that has steadily been replaced by a more aggressive, competitive self-interest based model of being. Yes, that's, that's fascinating. It was a, since the 1950s, you know, we built the National Health Service and the schools and so on. And um, but then gradually, as you say, that got chipped away with <laughs> neoliberalism. So this is, is a, such an important thing you're bringing back into politics, isn't it? It's this fundamental issue about how can we pay attention to those who, who need our help. So, Matt, how about you? What was your kind of push to bring this book together? Um, so I, I this the slight personal journey that I've been on, as well as what Jennifer has described about our professional experience working in politics. I had read your book, Paul, um, The Compassionate Mind, and it was helped explain to me and spoke to me both as individually at trying to help understand my place in the world, you know, the different experiences I was going through. But I think crucially, really helped give an explanation for how that journey that Jennifer has described that we have gone on as a country uh, provided a sort of long term looking evolutionary story about how we can develop as a society into one that is hyper competitive uh, and ego focused and individualistic, but crucially, of course, how in the right conditions and context, we can also be caring, compassionate, cooperative and inclusive and so given that rigorous grounding I, I sort of wanted to take the words of the book and try and bring as much of it into politics and to political organizing as I possibly could uh, so that was what led us to compassion in politics anyway and then um, the book itself is an attempt to articulate that story that you have uh, so brilliantly described in other uh, in other publications and then what would it look like if we took that knowledge and applied it to as many political issues as we can. 
Yes, I mean, I'm so excited. And I think all of us are so excited by what you are bringing into politics, what you're trying to texture politics with, you know, because you and I and Jennifer have had a number of discussions about this. I mean, humans can be incredibly compassionate, but tragically, the last four or 5,000 years, we've been horrendous, actually. I mean, if you think about our, our wars, our tortures, the way we've treated women and uh, slavery and so forth, humans can be one of the nastiest, most vicious species that have ever walked this planet. So when we talk about compassion, we're not talking about something that's a bit floozy or a bit weak. We're talking about a fundamental way in which we organize our minds, our relationships and our politics. So that is, I think, fundamental in, in your book, which is a wonderful, wonderful book. Um, how did you begin to choose the, the textures of the book and the, and the authors that you wanted in your book? I think we wanted compassion to be brought into every single academic discipline. You know, we have a tendency in the academy to compartmentalize our fields of study and compassion is something that cuts across every single area. So we were really keen to bring together those who speak about the science, such as yourself, who lead on, on the science of compassion, together with historians, philosophers, those who work on the front line of migration issues, those who work in the criminal justice system, really to see how compassion could be applied to every single aspect of our political world, including the environment and how it shouldn't be kept in a compartment or, or thought of as something that wasn't relevant to every aspect of how we as humans organize and we as humans live. Yes, that's, that's, I think it's such a fundamental point you make, isn't it? And um, how about you, Matt? What was your sort of thoughts behind the authors that you chose and the textures of the book that you brought together? Yeah, I mean, Jennifer's articulated it perfectly in the sense of <laughs> our goal is to very much take that scientific research and compassion and apply it as broadly as we can. I think we also wanted to see this very much as a first provocation and an experiment um, and to start the conversation about, well, what would a compassionate e e economy, what would a compassionate business climate look like? And to really start having those conversations with, with people who are already working in that space. Um, so we were looking for people who've articulated those sorts of views before but we also wanted authors to start to really test the authors and to see what they could develop and how that would develop in their their thinking around their particular subject area and as Jennifer rightly says not to just continue to think of it in, in one particular way or in silos but to to bring that broad understanding of our psychology of our evolution and really start to think about deeply about political issues through that lens. Yeah, I think that's a really fascinating uh, for both of you, really. And I suppose one of the interesting questions is that we don't actually know what these things look like. As you say, we don't actually know what a compassionate politics would look like, how it would function, how it would be different from how we are now. What would a compassionate business look like? What would a compassionate school look like? So if compassion was the focus of the mission statement of these organisations, what would they be like? So I think what you're doing is you're bringing these people together as you say to think about so what would it be like what would be the the obstacles what would be the difficulties of bringing a compassion orientation to politics so i think that's just extraordinary um so what what do you hope will be the um effect or the outcome of your of your book well we hope that conversations will start to happen across across the academic world and also across the activist world. It, I don't know if you found this, Paul, but we found when we started Compassion in Politics, people were cynical or, or tended to dismiss the idea as an oxymoron or good luck with that, <laughs> and tended to think of compassion as something light and fluffy. And we were dismissed in much the same way as women have historically been dismissed as a nice idea, but not very practical and not tough enough for the real world. And you know what the incredible work that you have done on the fact that compassion requires courage, it requires an overriding of natural fears, inhibitions and blocks is that we've been able to explain to those we work with and take into the political space your science, which shows that in fact, it's incredibly courageous, that compassion is, is hard, that it's tough, and that it can have a really dramatic change on how we function. And of course, 
in Parliament itself, that's a very, very real issue because we're dealing with a polit politics that is, is very triggered at the moment. Everyone is in a, a, a state of fight or flight. There's a lot of aggression and there isn't much room to create a safe space where conversations could happen in a generative field where people were able to talk with nuance, where people were able to admit they're wrong or able to admit their doubt because everyone is so defended that that has really become reputationally impossible, certainly in this country and I would say also in the US. And I think I was just going to add to what Jennifer has said. I think in terms of what we wanted the book to do, I think one of the accidental factors about the timing of the book coming out is that a lot of those conversations are starting to happen one of the things we find is that not always politicians are willing to have those there's some very notable exceptions but they are stuck in a context and a system that they um have sort of come to accept one which is very competitive quite brutish um certainly a, a place of bullying um but outside of that people are very clearly calling for something quite different something much more cooperative compassionate and inclusive so we're able to now offer this book at a time when i think those conversations are starting to happen about deeply about what the culture of our politics is like and how it absolutely has to change but the book therefore also provides a way in to talk to politicians and the ideas in the book provide a way in to talk to politicians about practically speaking what can we do to change this and make your life and the life of your constituents an awful lot better. Yes, I think that's very important. I mean, you know, as we were saying, you know, compassion is about courage, really courage and wisdom. And of course, this is not a particularly new idea that in the Buddhist traditions, compassion was always there to address what are sometimes called the mind poisons or the, the, the destructive aspects of the human mind, unfortunately, which we have uh, rather a lot. Um, I wonder if you think that, you know, part of the problem we have at the moment is that we've moved our media and our politics into highly competitive, and it's not so much a comp competition of ideas so much, it's a competition of undermining the opposition. So really, we're in a position now where political discussion, particularly, as I say, in the media and, and you know, in the general population is who can show the other side to be bad? <laughs> uh, who can show the other side to have all kinds of sort of deficits and flaws and bad things about them, as opposed to of trying to articulate a genuine uh, set of ideas and solutions for some of the terrible problems we have at the moment. Uh, and I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about that, that this issue of, it's not just competition, it's the competition of undermining, that's the problem. Nobody minds the competition of made the best person win of course that's what you want but it's the competition of undermining that really seems to be such a problem with politics at the moment you're, you're absolutely right Paul. and what we have is an incredibly adversarial system and it's binary you either win or lose you either win the election in which case the majority of the population who haven't voted for you then their views are not taken into consideration because the party with the most seats had the biggest majority and it, it doesn't reflect all of us. It's really the tyranny of government by whoever wins the election. And that's not what democracy is meant to be about. So we have this first past the post system of election where, where it's a tug of war between two major parties and that mitigates directly against cooperation, building consensus, finding common ground. And we have a punch and Judy style politics and of course we also have a punch and judy style media as a result because the two are in a symbiotic relationship you know the media wants to know who's winning who's losing and conflict sells newspapers gets viewers attention gets them clicking people being humiliated you know it's it's a more evolved version of of gladiatorial conflict and and that makes it very very difficult to have the sort of nuanced intelligent conversation that we need to have and so politics becomes less about how do we solve these huge problems that we face like climate change like hunger like inequality and it becomes whose ideology is going to win and 
each side's ideology really becomes like a club that they try to bash the other side into submission with. And of course, neither ideology is necessarily right. And so we're no longer looking for solutions. We're just looking for who can prove their view is more right than the other side. And, and rightness can be really distracting in this respect. People become incredibly attached to their view of how things ought to be conducted, their ideology, their solution, and they become blinkered and unable to hear better ideas. And of course, again, this two-party system means that you can't say actually the gentle man or woman on the other side of the house has a fantastic idea. I think we should adopt that because that would be political suicide to say that you agree with the other side or would like to see what they're suggesting become part of law. Yes, I think that's so, so important. And as I say, I think the, there's a difference between com competing for the good versus competing to undermine. I mean, we know that most primates, when they compete, they try to frighten the subordinates and undermine them. Competition is very much about undermining your competition. But that's absolutely what, not what we need at the moment. We do need a competition of ideas. So may the best ideas be brought forth, you see. So I think what you're doing, what you're trying to bring into politics, is a different way in which we can engage with difference and that you know some individuals will have better ideas than others that's just the way it is um so um wh what do you see as the obstacles to trying to bring your agenda into politics and the wider world actually um i mean i i think starting off with the um you can sort of work down various different layers of obstacles, which is not meant to be pessimistic, but there are we've got to be aware of them if we're going to do this project properly. Um, I think part of the one of the biggest obstacles is actually the motivation for why we started that we feel there's an accepted narrative out there that is that we are individualistic, competitive, um, highly driven to to beat down the other as a natural basis for where we should start from. And that is absolutely not the case and is not and as your research has proven, in certain contexts that can be true, but in other contexts where compassion and collegiate working are encouraged, we can be that way too. And indeed, we have been in our past after World War II, the building of the NHS and the welfare state. So I think that is the first thing we have to try and overcome that and build a different culture and build an alternative narrative about who we are. I think then we know there's lots of different fears and blocks that people already have to the idea of compassion and the strongest that we come across is just plain old tradition that parliament has always worked this way that it should work this way that, that shouting and booing and jeering is a perfectly normal thing to do in the house of commons and we have to go and work against that resistance that politicians already built up showing them that there is an alternative showing them that the public want a different way of working showing them that they will feel better if they work in a quite different context to the one that they are currently working in and calling out leadership i think one of the strongest resistances that people experience to any new type of experience is when they see their seniors acting in one particular way they're going to follow and do that so we need new desirable and workable um so those for us i think well for me those are the two big barriers that we're working up against yeah i think that's really in, in very very important how leaders like how parents work with really can people sort of copy that and um this whole idea about the way leaders can actually try it sometimes to stimulate the worst in us can't they because we are we can be very tribal uh, we can be very frightened of the future we can be frightened of losing our jobs and so many other things and fear has always been throughout history really leaders have always gone after fear and tribalism to get themselves into positions of power but unfortunately those are the last parts of our psychology we need right now we need actually as you say the politics of cooperation of genuinely coming together to work out uh, what are the solutions to these problems like social injustice and so forth so i think you know what you're doing is just extraordinary really but it, it you can see what you're up against can't you really it's quite quite tricky do you think you're gradually <laughs> making progress sorry yeah well, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I, I was just going to say, Paul, that it is tricky, but for every bit of cynicism and resistance that we meet, 
Um, there are so many politicians who are so grateful that we exist and that is profoundly moving to us that we started this organization and that we can really support those politicians from whichever party we work, politicians across the political spectrum, but that we can support them in promoting a compassionate agenda. And there is this real dichotomy, you know, how politicians behave on television, how they behave in the house and how they can behave when they're brought together in a cross-party way to try and solve a common problem. For example, um, we're supporting a, a group of cross-party MPs who are looking at the issue of online harm. And the way they work together is really, really moving. They come from opposite sides of the political divide, but because they are joined in common purpose, that common purpose of how do we make the online space safer, how do we reduce toxicity, hate, misinformation, they're working from their higher selves, but until the way we do government is willing to relinquish that combative adversarial showcase for itself, it's going to be very hard for that really to spread. And of course, the other problem is that those who have power, who've gained power through this system are very reluctant to relinquish it. So it's a steady process of, of also appealing to politicians and reminding them why they came into politics. I don't think we know of one politician who didn't come in with a genuine motivation. It may have been mixed up with personal ambition and all of those other things that politicians often bring to bear, but there was a desire to leave the world a better place. But, but often the business of politics requires an abandonment of that primary motivation. It requires compromise, it requires towing the party line, it requires saying yes when your instinct says no because that's what party loyalty requires. And what we do is, is we support MPs who are wobbling, those who have doubts, and we amplify them when they take compassionate action or make take a compassionate stand or speak out because we need to amplify the good that is there. At the moment, the hate is being amplified and that's all. That's not all that is in the political space. There's an incredible amount of compassion and well-intentioned people working for solutions. They're just getting drowned out. So, so we're trying to build that common ground, that compassionate common ground. And, and the MPs that we work with report back that they have felt support from the other side of the house on issues where compassion is the common link. I think that is uh, absolutely wonderful because as you say, you know, we've always said, you know, the only thing for, for bad to pr uh, progress is for good to do nothing. And the suppression of the good, I think, through the process of this undermining competitive ways in which people are engaged in their political debate is really such a problem. So if we can stop suppressing the good and stop you know, give people the courage and the wisdom to come forward with what they perceive to be compassionate solutions. That's terrific. And I suppose one of the things that gives us heart, and I'm sure you too, is the way that over the last 10 years, we've gradually seen this emerging. So if you could think of the Me Too movement, you could think of what's happening about racism in sport right now, this gradual preparedness to come out and address some of the dark side of, of humanity. So, and, and, and bringing that into politics, because as you say, there are many, many people within politics. I mean, we remember Jean Cox, of course, who just, you know, are really dedicated to try to find ways to improve the, the ways in which we live together. So, I mean, how do you see yourself as going from here? I mean, what, what are your plans to take the work forward and the, maybe more writings, perhaps, or books or whatever? Um, I just wanted to pick up on what you said about Joe... Cox, the Labour MP who was so sadly murdered, and her, you know, her firm belief that there is we have more in common. Yeah. And that is really, really the, the message that is, that is at the heart of what we do, that we have to focus what we have on what we have in common, not on what makes us different, you know, and that focus on difference has led to this atomized society that is ridden with loneliness and inequality and it really hasn't worked for any of us that's the other thing those who are winning think this system is working for them but actually we know that levels of happiness are far higher in a society where there is greater 
equality. And the other thing you mentioned is uh, movements like Me Too and Black Lives Matter. And they're incredibly important because they show that each of us has our role to play, that it doesn't matter how difficult and unpleasant and callous the polit political environment has been, there is still space for us as humans to talk about the truth, to talk about justice, to talk about what really matters and to show up and that we can begin to affect change when enough of us act from the heart together. So hope is so important because it's really easy to become disillusioned, cynical, despairing in the face of the political forces that we're looking at re-emerging across the world at the moment. But actually the strength that we have as humans when we act in a concerted effort and when we all stand up for what we believe in has the power to create a very different outcome. That's so inspiring, isn't it? Because that's the root, that is what compassion is, the sensitivity to suffering and the determination to address it and dig out its causes. That's what it is. It's, you know, people think it's a bit about kindness or a bit of love. I mean, they're, they're fine, I'm all in favor of love and kindness, but really, really the core of compassion is this awareness of the causes of suffering and the determination to root out those causes of suffering. That's such an important point you're making, Jennifer. How about yourself, um, Matt? Thinking about how, where you want to go from here and the next projects and things. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Um, I mean, we, we generally try and roughly divide our work between um, sort of half our time spent on changing the culture, the processes that are in Parliament, in particular, but in politics generally, to create a more compassionate atmosphere. And then we spend the other rest of our time on looking at specific policies that we feel are needed to get a more compassionate um, society to do more to try and prove the case that we don't have a psychologically healthy politics right now, and that needs to change. Uh, there's some specific programs we're working on trying to bring compassion training, sort of work that you've you and the foundation have done trying to bring that into parliament we're looking to work on the whipping system in parliament because that is essentially a type of formalized bullying changing the way that debates happen getting rid of the booing and the jeering and the hollering which just creates an atmosphere of toxicity and inhumanity in our politics which then spreads out across the country um and then on the policy side uh, one thing that we're we're really keen on is getting the leaders to agree to a basic broad set of compassionate principles that no policy in the future should be allowed to push people further into destitution or uh, to benefit current generations at the expense of future ones and in the last couple of weeks we've seen policies introduced that do exactly that change to social care for example the 20 pound the cutting of the 20 pound from universal credit we don't think those sorts of things should be allowed in a in a country that believes itself to be a compassionate nation so we're trying to work with the political leaders as best we can to get them to agree that going forwards that's not going to be allowed yeah that's just wonderful isn't it and um uh that's so inspiring <laughs> um and at the heart of that paul is your no harm principle may i be helpful rather than harmful because we have successive governments here and elsewhere around the world who are told that the impact of specific policies they introduce will lead to hunger, will lead to homelessness, will lead to suffering, will need, will risk a rise in infant mortality. And yet those policies are enacted irrespective of what is known about what the consequence, consequences would be. So, you know, the thing I think that we want to achieve most is building a consensus that if you are in government, you cannot introduce policies that harm those you are leading. There has to be a duty of care towards the citizens in, in every country between the government and the citizens. And at the moment there, there isn't and governments can knowingly with complete disregard enact policies that cause harm and loss of life. And that cannot be acceptable given the, the place that we are in at this time with all that we know with the wealth that we have globally 
at our disposal that we willfully enact policies that are going to create real human suffering. Yeah, so I mean, that's wonderful. I mean, that a gr gr a grain of awareness, raising of awareness, because I mean, that, as you know, we're working with business and the issues are, obviously we need to create wealth or we feel we want to create wealth, but it's how do we create it? What are the goods and services we're creating and do they do harm? Okay, so that's very important. How are people involved in the creation of wealth? Because one of the problems we have, obviously, is that people who don't feel they have a part in wealth creation and with the coming of automation, this is going to be a big political issue, right? How do we try to create a culture, a society and a world where people can make contributions and they can be part of wealth creation? They're not kept out of it. And then the third one, of course, is the big one for politics is how do we decide on how the wealth that the world creates is distributed? And I mean, these are huge political issues. These are those three major things. What are we creating and how? Who is involved in the creation and how do we distribute the, the um, products of our wealth? These are, these are massive uh, issues. So, you know, the way you're thinking about this stuff, I think, again, I, I would say is very, very inspiring. So, I mean, I suppose my last question, because I could talk to you forever, um, how, how could people get involved, apart from buying your book, which, of course, I'm sure. I'm really hopeful people will do after listening to this interview. How, how can people get involved with compassion in politics? Um, I mean, that's a really good start, buying the book, certainly. Um, we, um, I mean, we talk about this a little bit in the book, actually, that there's sorts of very different levels of engagement. I think one of the amazing things really about um, compassion as a way into talking about these issues is that it is so clearly something that ev absolutely everyone can engage in and the way that you treat other people just in your day-to-day -day life that has a knock-on effect on the way that they go on to treat other people in their lives and so forth and the views that you articulate um the, the way the behaviors that you you choose to show it to be to other people in your workplace so these are all just individual acts appreciably but they they stack up and they change the way that we think about society and um, in terms of getting involved in us we have you know a website with where people can sign up to become supporters and then we obviously engage people as much as we can in taking action whether it's talking to their mp talking to their council you know running campaigns at election time those sorts of things so there's lots of there's lots of activist type type um uh, solutions to getting involved if you like and then if you're in a different area in society if you're in business or if you're in politics or if you're in the media talk to us come and get involved see the difference that we believe a compassionate way of doing doing those um doing those roles would make to the rest of society because we're here for conversations and we want to start to build those bridges yeah and we're very ambitious you know we've started compassion in politics but why not compassion in business compassion in education compassion in healthcare obviously we have people like michael west doing amazing work in healthcare and yourself but but we really have a vision that is to introduce compassion consciously with awareness with the science into every single walk of life because it ties in with what the meaning and purpose that all of us are looking for because it brings us back to our our higher selves you know what why are we here and if the very at the very least we can be here to reduce avoidable suffering and and diminish harm then we're fulfilling a higher a higher calling and a higher purpose and the other thing is that you know we very strongly believe that there is a compassionate majority in in our country and in countries around the world but we have to make that compassionate majority visible you know, so if you sign up on our website, you will be adding another number to those who stand up for compassion in the political space. And we've had voluntary groups spring up across the world, Australia, United States, Argentina, Chile, Europe. So people who want to get involved and haven't got a compassion in politics group yet in their country can talk to us and we can support them in setting one up or point them to a group that already exists because we have to make the demand and the desire for ca compassion visible. It's there, but unless it's articulated, it will be ridden roughshod over as sadly it is being at the moment.
Yeah, I think that's so important. And the other point is that people are beginning to realize from the science that compassion actually is more efficient and you will get better results. So if you look at compassionate businesses, those businesses that treat their staff well, are those businesses who actually go the extra mile for their customers, for their consumers, are those businesses who take an interest in the environment, these businesses are the ones that are more likely to flourish than those that treat their, their employees badly uh, and damage the environment and so forth. We know that at universities now, there's that uh, compassion is being introduced into seminar groups. And if you get seminar groups to work together compassionately rather than compete with each other, they learn better. We find in schools, there's a compassion program in schools. So everywhere you look, right, once you get people working together and they feel safe and their ability to work together and co-contribute, um, things actually become much more efficient and they move much faster. So I think this is really quite important because otherwise people get this idea that compassion is just about being a bit nice, a bit this, a bit that, but not really. I mean, it's a, it's a very, very fundamental motivation that has huge payoffs, not only that, but it has huge payoffs in terms of mental well-being. that when people feel part of a compassionate society, compassionate group, and they're able to be compassionate to themselves, they're much less vulnerable to mental health problems, stress and aggression and so on. So, you know, Compassion is a winner all around, and it's just really helping people see that. That's why what you're doing is such a fundamental movement of actually helping politicians recognize that compassion isn't just about being nice or being a bit moral. It's actually fundamental to changing the nature of our ways in which we solve political problems. So we're going and to... And I think, sorry, sorry, Paul, just to add to that, I think that because mo most of, well, compassion is innate, we know that. So when we override the compassionate solution, there is a level of disease that exists. We may not be conscious about it. We may have shoved our true emotional response down beneath a layer of concrete denial, but that disease is still there. You know, as you walk past, as you encounter suffering in your daily life, if you do nothing, there's a level of guilt and disease and despair that we all carry and when one becomes active that begins to dissipate because one is then starting to connect with one's true inner inner knowing that that compassion is innate and by far the best way to respond to any situation in which there is suffering that's extraordinary that's wonderful so we're going to coming to the end now sadly so are there any uh, final comments you'd like to um, uh, add and then I'll show them the book again and really ask people to go out and buy it because it really is a terrific book. So any final comments? I think I was just going to add um, Paul that I think bringing as you have back to the book um, I just I feel like hopefully if people do buy it and read it what it what it can bring is just that sense that it is such a different way, or well, it can be such a different way and a powerful way to look at to look at very different issues. So I think we were talking before about the no harm principle. Well, we have a chapter in there on crime, and it, and it's and it looks at whether prisons are the best way to deal previously in their in their lives. Similarly, is is digging up fossil fuels and using them the compassionate way to think about the lives of future generations so i think just to take it as that nugget and to start to apply it as many different ways as you can we hope that well we hope the book provides that bit of that push and inspiration for everyone i think it's yeah that's such an important thing and also what is the compassionate solutions to help people move out of fossil fuels because a lot of people hold on to them because they're worried about losing their jobs and their traditions and so forth so you know we can't just you know we have to have solutions for those mm -hmm. That's part of a compassionate solution, right? Okay, so look, I, I think I, I can't thank you enough for spending the time to come and talk to us about your the wonderful work you do and uh, your book. So I'm going to show the book again now. Okay, so here we go, and then people can people can go out and buy it. So that's uh, Jennifer. You've been listening to Jennifer Nadal and Matt Hawkins today. That's Compassion in Politics. This is the book. Please go out and buy it because I think you will be quite amazed at how many excellent areas they take compassion into and also really underline the fact that the most important thing of compassion is courage and wisdom to address suffering. 
it's one of the most, most important and needed motivations that we have, that we need in the world today. So it's goodbye from me. It's goodbye from Jennifer. Goodbye from Matt.